Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Got a question for you. Have you ever walk, woke up and, and wondered what the heck is going on? <laughs> or, or, what, that's happened to me lately. Because every time I open my Bible to, to read something, it, it, uh, I know the last few sermons have been on it, and I keep trying to hide from them. Uh, because every time I open up, it's about living in a rough world. It's been this way going on even before I, I came here. Because every I'm like, okay, I gotta find something else to read. I gotta find something else to study. I, I want something else. I want something that's gonna be peace and joy and love and, and yay. And for some reason, I keep ending up back in these same spots. Those last couple of weeks, I begin to understand why. Because most of the Bible is like a view into the future. What's happened in the past will happen, is, happen, is happening now, and will happen again. And most of the Bible is a light to God. And it's also, though, a book teaching us how to live a holy, godly witness in an increasingly hostile world. Because we know that this world is filled with evil. It is filled with anti-Christian, anti-godly thoughts and wisdoms. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to submit to God. And this week, one of the things, the, the Bible verse or book that kept coming to mind is Daniel. So let us turn to the book of Daniel and see how a young man of a, a teenager truly a teenager, lived a life that was holy and pleasing in a very pagan-centered world, a hostile world to everything he believed. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we ask that your spirit to be here with us. We've gathered in your name. We want to hear your word. We want to feel your spirit. So, Lord... Be with us now as we read your holy and precious word and how it can affect and help us in our life living here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put vessels in the treasury of his God. The king ordered Athens, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility. Young men, without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledge, perceptive and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from wine that, that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they to attend the king. Among them, from the Judites, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezra. The chief eunuch gave them new names. He gave them Belshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Michelle, and Abednego to Ezra. Think about that for, for a moment. Here's a young royal, noble, rich, uh, and, and according to the scripture, probably rich, good looking, you know, had everything going for him. He was in the royal house and lineage of Israel, the powerful Daniel, and all of a sudden, they're overthrown by an enemy. I can imagine that there were horror stories of what Nebuchadnezzar would do to them. You knew what Babylon was like, the type of country it was, the values of it, that they served many other gods. So all of a sudden, your family's out of power, out of authority, 
you, you, and in this time frame, when, when they raided a country, they would also take the money, the gold, and everything. There wasn't an ATM, so most of it was stored in their house or in their treasuries and in their things. So Daniel's family had suddenly lost everything. And along comes this chief eunuch, this royal guard. Not only has they lost everything, he's going to take him away from his home as a young teenager and take him to a foreign land. He's in captivity. And he's also then going to be forced to study another language. He's going to be forced to study other gods, other religions, other literatures. And you know what else they did to degrade him? They took his name. Daniel had, in Hebrew, had a strong name. And God took that. It meant God is my judge. And then when they gave him the name Belshazzar instead of God is my judge, it made Bel, Baal, protect him. Bel isn't basically Satan. It's another name for a non-God. It, it's the other, other world. So he went from this to having to be called by it, something that would make him upset, angry. And yet, that's the world in which he lived. That's, he was or what he was going to be living in. He was going to go from being kosher and eating all the right foods in the right way because he was at what was expected of him to now living a different lifestyle, getting different types of foods, getting all of this different wine and all of this pleasurable things that some of the other people went ahead and did. They went ahead and partook of that. I mean, I'm sorry. If, if you're not to eat bacon and all of a sudden... You're in a country that says it's okay to eat bacon and you've never had a bacon sandwich and you eat it and it's good. People easily go that way. We don't, we don't eat the way we're supposed to. And how do we expect a, kid, a child, a young man, when everybody else was doing that, to follow what God had told him to do? But here's the powerful thing, and I think this is one of the first things we can really look at. After we're taken into captivity and we, and we are living in an evil world. We are too. We, we are, we go out, we're going to leave here, we're going to go out, and we're going to be bombarded with all types of stuff. All types of lifestyles, all types of pleasures, all types of things that God says this isn't good for Christians to do. So it's our choice. But we live in a hostile world. We live in a pagan world. We live in an unholy world. Pretty much like Daniel was living at the time. And here's the lesson, one of the first lessons I see, is that Daniel was faithful in Babylon. He immediately, as he's going to there, gets his first opportunity to follow God. Look in verse 8. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch to not defile himself. Think of the boldness. He's a captor. He's young. He's, he's in captivity and he's young. And, and all of a sudden, he, he's bold enough to go to the head guard and say, excuse me, bud. Excuse me, sir. I don't want to eat this because it goes against my religion, my faith. My God. That's some boldness. Imagine if we were that faithful. Or can we be that faithful? What would that look like for you in your life to be like Daniel? To take that moment and that opportunity when it first arises to be faithful to God. See, Daniel knew his Bible. He knew the scriptures. He knew that Exodus 35 had, had told him that he couldn't work, eat any food that had been offered to an idol. So he couldn't eat the king's food because that was stuff that had been offered to idols and brought into the king's house and brought in to celebrate. 
And this is what's unusual. Daniel knew who he was. So when he was faithful, he found favor with the eunuch. Guy said, okay. And he listened to him. He found kindness and compassion. And so then Daniel does one other thing. Because he knows that the eunuch is, is scared. Because guess what? If, 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 the, if I give all this, if I don't give this guy food and his friends, if, if I don't do all the, God, the king has told me to do, and all of a sudden they're, they're not able to do their physical exercises, or they're not able to fight, they're not able to do these things, they begin to look hazard, they begin to not be as sharp as they were when they got here, I'm in trouble. And the king, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to not only throw me in jail, he might kill me. So Daniel proposes a test. He basically says, okay, God, I'm going to take you at your word. I, and he says, so Daniel told, said to the guard in verse 11, to whom the chief eunuch and assigned to Daniel, and I am Mesil and Desiree, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young man who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. He put God, he took God at his word and said, I'm going to trust that you're going to be faithful here, God. He walked out in faith. And basically puts God to a test to see if he, to, to see if this, how this is going to work. Imagine if we would do that. If we would walk out in faith the way Daniel did, said, "Holy, let's put God, let's, let's trust God for His word. Let's show you what He can do, and are willing to do that." Now we know that He agreed with them, and so then tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, they were better healthier, stronger than the other people who had been eating the king's food. Because when God shows up, powerful things happen. Daniel's faith was rewarded because he walked in that faith. I imagine Daniel probably could have been like some of the other ones were taken and said, no, we'll go ahead and eat it. But God had a plan for Daniel's life to be this living witness in this very hostile world. And so when Daniel was faithful, God was faithful to, and he was stronger, healthier, and better looking than all the rest. So the guard continued to remove their food and wine, and, and all they drank was vegetables and water. How many of you want to drink vegetables and water for your the rest of your life? When you're out exercising, studying languages, studying literature, studying... Anybody remember going to college and high school? It's actually draining. It's emotionally and it can be physically draining trying to stay focused and then go and get some green beans and water. Maybe some collard greens, broccoli, salad. I wouldn't like that. But it's probably better for me. <laughs> but Daniel did and he was trusting in the Lord and he was blessed even though he was living in a hostile world reading non-Jewish literature learning about non-Jewish gods learning about all of these things where he's going to serve an unholy king God still blessed him with wisdom and stature and all of these things And Daniel's witness is rewarded. Because when we are faithful, witness is always blessed. Look in verse 17. So God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. And Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. At the end of the time that the king had, had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Aniah, Mishael, and Ezra. Ezra. 
So they began to attend the king. In every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and mediums in his entire kingdom. Wow. Daniel was faithful. God was faithful. And that faithfulness was rewarded in powerful ways. Not only in powerful ways that he could understand it, but you begin to see when we look through the rest of Daniel later on, we will see that he was elevated to the highest ranks. These four were the best in all of the entire kingdom. And they continued to serve in that unholy kingdom. He consulted. They became his right-hand men. They became his secretary of state and, and well, he, Nebuchadnezzar's cabinet was a little smaller than the American presidential cabinet, but these were his cabinet members. These were his counselors, whether it was on things of religion, uh, whatever, literature, war, all of that. Dealing with the people, these four were the best. Because God gave them that knowledge and understanding of all things, and they were still living in a hostile. Now we know that Babylon was took over Israel because God was using Babylon as a means of punishment and correction to the government. But in all of that, there was still a core group of people who were being true and faithful and were elevated for a reason. Daniel and his friends still continued to live in that pagan world. They still taught. Now, we know that Daniel stayed faithful in everything he did, but he also still went by the name. Belshazzar, the king called. He didn't call him Daniel. He called him by his new name, and he would answer to him. But even in that, even though he was, there was, he was expected to read, study, and do things that go to, went against his faith, he still lived it to the best of his ability, to be the best he could be in the midst of a terrible place because he was a living witness of that God. And we know at the end of this that pays off if you've ever read the whole book of Daniel. But Daniel continued to live out his witness. Later on in the book, they tell him that he has to stop praying and doing the things he's doing and say that Nebuchadnezzar is God and, and he doesn't. And we know he gets thrown in the, the den because he was faithful even when the people wanted him hurt, he stayed faithful and he got, he continued to be elevated. We can do the same thing. The country in which we live is changing rapidly. And I always have held this belief that we get the president we deserve. <laughs> Not the one we want, but the one we deserve. And for some reason right now, the people in power and the large groups of people in power are really hostile to the things of Christianity. Okay. That's okay. Because if we are faithful, God will be faithful. It will be rewarded in our witness will be recognized. We may not, I, I, I may not be the next Secretary of State ever. But where I'm at and the place I'm located, I'm honored because I'm true to my beliefs. So much that when they needed a, this situation at work, they asked for Jeff. Because I'm true and faithful, hopefully, the best of my ability. And they recognize that. And the same thing we said for you guys. In every place that you're at, if we learn to live in this world, because we are the witness, we are the remnant, like Daniel was and his friends. We're the remnant that's going to be faithful and pull people towards us in a hostile world. People are still watching. People are still hurting. And we are called for this day. Daniel was called to his day, and so was his friends. And Jesus and his disciples were there for their day and their time. And now it's our time. 
And we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses to show us the way. We are called to live a witness in a hostile. We come in together, we separate for worship, we separate for strength, we separate to support each other, but then we go out to find a spiritual battle. Someone you're going to come in contact with this week may be the only time they see a true living Christian. What will they see? Will they see faithfulness? Will it be rewarded? That's all up to you and how you live your life. But I do know Daniel had to suffer. He had to be, I mean, he had to say, I'm not going to eat all that and face that ridicule and, and give up some of that good food. He got vegetables and water. Pretty much for the rest of his life. But he was willing to because of God. What are we willing to do for God? Because it's our time. No time, there's been nothing like the current state in America for years. It's our time to be that witness, to step up the game, to understand what we're going to do. And I believe that everyone here is worthy and able to live that witness because the power of the Holy Spirit will empower you to stand boldly, to proclaim loudly the gospel of Jesus Christ through your actions. Let us be Daniels. Let us be Daniels. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, Daniel was a great witness to us all. He and his four friends remained faithful. Even though they had lost, they had been taken from their home and what they knew, what was comfortable, what was easy. And they were placed in a foreign land with foreign beliefs, a foreign culture, foreign religions. And all of it, they stayed true to you and their witness. And you honored that. Not only did you respect it and protect them, you elevated them to the highest levels of government. Even though they were in, a, in an unholy government, they still served. And they served godly. Help us to do that. Because we are living in an unholy and an ungodly world. Help us to live godly lives. And that our witness for you, about you, would be elevated. Honored and respected. In your son's name I pray. Amen.